Welcome to another Comic Source Comic Boom collaboration. Sorry, it's coming to you a little bit late, um, but as you can see, I'm on the road in a hotel room, uh, but we are recording this on Tuesday. We'll drop it right after. Books came out today. Really interesting week. Rocky and I were just chatting about it briefly before uh, we jumped on. Um, yeah, I, it's going to be interesting to talk about these books because um, I will just add one thing. Because we had a little bit of, not necessarily extra time, but I was on a plane, airport, that kind of thing, waiting around on stuff. Some of these books I read more than once, and normally I don't have time to do that. And I found, my, found myself enjoying them a lot better the second time. And it made me think, man, I wish I had time to read every DC book twice before we review it every week. Because I feel like I get, at least for some of these books, I get a lot more out of them um, reading them the second time. So anyway, what, what were your thoughts on the week overall, Rocky? Uh, I enjoyed this week a little better overall. There was, uh, I got JSA, Superman Lost in Danger Street, and Wildcats I liked. Uh, so I was battering. I liked four out of eight. I enjoyed four out of eight uh, uh, reasonably well. And um, yeah, and I, I also read them more than once as well. And I usually try to read them more than once anyway. I do take notes. And I absolutely agree that Part of the dangers when we you review as many comics as you and I do in a given week, it, it's certainly a danger that we could give some comics a short thrift. Although I did give one comic short thrift this week because I just plain didn't. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't matter how much time I have, I just don't care about some comics, and uh, we'll talk about that when we get to it. <clears throat> Hardly uh, screws up the DC universe, but yeah, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I tried. I tried. I tried twice, and I just it's just not you know I'm not the target audience for that. Yeah. So anyway, but, we'll, uh, but I want to uh, but I want to I want to start off first. I want to I want to ask you your opinion because we got some news. Uh, I want, I want, I want to hear your opinion before I give mine on, uh, the DC comic news, uh, Tom King, uh, writing Wonder Woman. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm always excited when, um, you know, Tom gets announced on a new title. Now, what I find really interesting, uh, and Tom talked about this the last time when he was on the show, um, around Christmas time and, you know, he, he, he writes it typically, and this happened during the pandemic, he writes everything like it kind of in one sitting, right? Like as one big story. And then it gets chopped up into 12 issues or eight issues or six issues or, or whatever, rather you know, because the pandemic and the slowdown allowed him to get ahead. Um, as opposed to most writers where they're writing, you know, let me, I'm going to write my issue for, you know, two months from now of action comics, let's say. And we'll use Phil Kenny Johnson as an example. So in any given month, he's going to write, aliens he's going to write action comics he's going to write um you know whatever else he's writing wonder woman dead earth whatever um and then the following month he's going to write the next issue of each of those and so on and so forth um but you know tom has been doing things where hey here's a 12 issue doctor or uh, 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 adam strange miniseries here's a 12 issue rorschach miniseries whatever so he gets to write the whole thing beginning middle and end these are finite stories it's been a long time since he's been on a monthly, right? Since Batman, which wasn't received that well, started out great. And I, I, and I agree. And this was, doesn't all, I'm not going to blame it all on Tom. There was a lot of editorial interference, a lot to do with shifting timelines, other, other things with the rebirth story that were supposed to happen that got pushed back because of other creators being late and slow and that sort of thing. So don't put all the blame on Tom, but at the same time, at the end of the day, it's your responsibility to put out a good story. And it really dragged. It really dragged and it got better toward the end. And I'm not, and the other thing about it is, you know, Tom, he really loves the idea of Batman and Catwoman together. I don't, I don't. And that was, you know, his whole story, hundred page or a hundred issue plan story was a Batman Catwoman love story. So that's never really going to, you know, be my favorite type of Batman story. But I say all that to say this, it's him back on a monthly title. He can't just write the whole thing. Right. So uh, I'm real curious. Next time I see him, I'll ask him, Hey, you know, how are you doing this as opposed to your normal, what, what has become your normal style? Um, so I'm cautious, cautiously optimistic. I haven't enjoyed Wonder Woman for a long, long time. Um, to be honest with you, probably I haven't enjoyed Wonder Woman on a month in month out basis since the Greg Rucka days when he was working with Liam Sharp and Nicholas Scott. 
those two different timelines for rebirth. So, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. It's interesting. Some of the ideas that he's put forth, um, you know, the outside world fears, Diana, I think in Amazonian terrorist, I think, or maybe it wasn't terrorist, but threat or so, something along those lines. Tom, yeah. he has experience, you know, with that real world experience. So that, that kind of paranoia, the politics of it, I find that to be interesting. And then, you know, it's frosting on the cake as it's Daniel Semper art. So regardless of whether I'm enjoying the story as much as I could, just like with Batman on Tom's run where he had fantastic artists, you know, Mikhail Yanin, David Finch, Mitch Garrids, Tony Daniel, it's going to look beautiful. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll forgive some shortcomings in the story. Um, but as long as he doesn't go too dark, um, you know, the political <laughs> intrigue, the, the political intrigue, and paranoia and distrust that can work, but he can't, he, he can't go like heroes in crisis darkness. Um, that that's gonna, that doesn't work for Wonder Woman in my mind. So yeah, very interesting. I did not expect, you know, of all the people to be on Wonder Woman, I wouldn't, it, it, that's not a, ma a matchup that I really ever thought about Tom King on Wonder Woman. It's very, very interesting. So yeah. how about you? What are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, I, I, w I was shocked that it was put on Wonder Woman. There's no question. Uh, I've, uh, you know, I've, well, you and I have generally liked most of what Tom King has done, but uh, it just so happened I, I didn't like him being on Batman, and I didn't like Heroes in Crisis. Like, nobody liked him on Heroes in Crisis. So the fact that he's now on a longstanding title like Wonder Woman, it does so have, I do have some concerns. Uh, I'll be blunt, I if uh, and I'm, I'm the outlier on this. Uh, Wonder Woman is so badly written, I don't care if he goes dark with her. I, I, I'm, in fact, I'll be very blunt. I think it's, it would be consistent with the existing storyline that maybe we need a little bit more darkness in Wonder Woman because I get, I'm so sick and tired of Wonder Woman being this, uh, you know, supplicating herself, getting on her knees, uh, giving a speech, wrapping things up with a magic lasso. She has not really been adequately challenged. I love the idea of his storyline being a terrorist Amazon. I know some people are uh, complaining that, you know, the this, this Amazon Safety Act, this Amazon extradition entity that's created called Axe, people are thinking that is too reminiscent of some Marvel storylines. I don't care. I don't care. Uh, just give me a great storyline. Uh, I think that the I think the, the, the citizens of the DC universe have ample reason to be fearful of the Amazons. Uh, Wonder Woman resurrected terrorist Greek gods who are, are, are busy right now in a storyline enacting revenge of the gods. Uh, we've had all kinds of uh, Hera is a terror. Uh, uh, Hippolyta uh, for all but committed suicide to become a god. Uh, the Amazons themselves uh, just have a, uh, an elected queen, Nubia, who is absolutely absolutely incompetent by every measure. We've had a disastrous trial of the Amazons that inflicted chaos on the world, a got literal chaos in the world. And so I think the world has ample reason to be terrified of the Amazons. And is it a surprise that the world would take some action upon an another Amazon being considered a terrorist? Not at all. So I think it actually works. But ironically enough, Tom King is not somebody who enjoys continuity or who cares about continuity. So I got some concerns about that. But I'll be blunt, if, uh, if he goes, uh, there, there's a lot of people out there who claim to have read Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow and apparently can't see the hope in, uh, and hope of that because they're focused on the genocide and not the heroism at the end of it. Um, if he writes it like Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow and reels it in like that, it's, it's going to be an evergreen. And uh, that's what I'm hoping. So it's either going to be an epic, epic success or an abject failure. So my fingers are, my fingers are crossed and we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I, I I sort of agree with you. I don't think it'll just be oh ho hum. Tom King is going to be really good, or or it just won't work. Um, and through no fault of you know Tom's effort or or Daniel Samper's effort. What's interesting, um, as far as I can remember, you know, you talk about nobody liking Heroes in Crisis. As far as I can remember, that's really the only time Tom has written Wonder Woman that I can think of. No, he wrote her. He wrote her in a Batman uh, four issue. Bat. She started in Batman, where Batman and her were trapped against the Gentleman. They were trapped thirty years together in another oh, realm, right. and they were doing battles. And he he was doing this homage. Was thinking, yeah, yeah, I was mixing that up with the Batman Brave and the Bold, Batman Wonder Woman Brave and the Bold that Liam Sharp did. But yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah. So we've but, we have had a little bit of and, Diane and his voice. 
Yeah, he never captured her voice very well in that series, <laughs> but uh, in my mind. But uh, I'm really curious to see how he, he captures Wonder Woman here. But I'm going to reserve judgment. I mean, like I said, I can I got no problem loving Tom King when I if I like the stories. But if it's like his Batman run, I'm going to, you know, we'll have to wait and see. We'll have to wait and see. But, you know, I always like to say, can it be any worse than Clunrad? <laughs> I mean, I hope yeah. Tom King's not saying hold my beer, but we'll have to wait and see. So, so, yeah, so on that point, a couple other points to, to make. I wonder if they'll have a chance to wrap up everything. I mean, it doesn't seem to be selling that well. A lot of people may not care, but they've got yeah. a lot of plot threads, but they're not like really detailed and well-defined. You know, you mentioned Hippolyta being a goddess and and that sort of thing, and everything is just sort of meandering. So can, can they pull yeah. it together? Can they tie up all their threads? Will it matter? I don't know. And yeah. then the other thing that's interesting is, uh, you know, Wonder Woman she has had so many different volumes over the years, like uh, al almost as many as like Captain America over on the Marvel side. Yeah. And currently they've reverted back to the legacy numbering. You know, it's up in the 800s, I think, right? 700s, 800s, something like that. This is starting over with a new number one. Um, and it's, it's is it August or September? I, I know it's late in the year. September, the year. I think it is. Yeah. So starting again with a new number one, you know, they always want that bump, but it probably won't yeah. be long before it gets back to the, the legacy numbering. But it makes me wonder, you know, do do they have him like what what it, it's is it in the seven nineties, I think? Well, it's starting at eight hundred. What do you mean? Yeah, Wonder I mean, what, starting what, at issue eight hundred, right? That's the legacy numbering. Issue one will be eight hundred. Okay, yeah. So that's what I was thinking. Um, it, are they planning a hundred issue run? So he gets to 900. I, I um, don't know. Well, I mean, it, it's hard to imagine Tom King writing a hundred issues of wonder woman. It really, really is. But, <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, see. yeah, that was his plan for Batman though. If he has a long, long form story. So yeah. anyway, it's all up in the air, hoping to have Tom and Daniel on at some point to chat about it when it gets closer. I'm, uh, you know, they're both friends, so I'm sure I can make that happen. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, you guys are like, all right, stop talking about wonder woman, get to the books. Um, so we'll kick it off with Wildcats number five from writer Matthew Rosenberg. Stephen Segovia and Christian Duce are the artists. Elmer Santos is the colorist. Farron Delgado on letters. Um, I, I don't want to be like super negative about the art, but this doesn't look anything like Stephen Segovia art to me. It's much looser. It doesn't look anything like Christian Duce art either. So this is one of those instances where I think the guy, they just didn't mesh really well. Uh, the sum of them is not greater than the individuals because um, I like Christian Duce art. I like Stephen Scobia art typically, but it feels like he's using, a, even when he's been on Wildcats on his own without uh, a co-artist, it has felt more like he's leaning into a, ma a manga style um, and it's a little looser and less detailed. And I, I don't, I don't really care for it. I don't like it as much as his style that he's shown like, when I think of Steven Segovia, what I think of is his art on Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, Green Lantern, and the Green Lantern Corps uh, with Robert Venditti. That that was just fantastic. Um, and so maybe it's not fair, you know, uh, if Steven wants to try a different art style and, and you know, Wildcats being a Wildstorm property, maybe it has a little more in common with manga than, you know, a traditional DC legacy character. So maybe that's what he's going for. Um, and I, I don't mean to say that the art is bad uh, because it's beautiful for what it is. It's just not my favorite style of art. Um, and like I said, it, it felt a little a little incomplete at times. As far as the story goes, um, Wildcat's still uh, investigating Cole Cash's death. And I'll put that in quotes because we all know they're not DC's not really going to kill off Grifter. And certainly Matthew Rosenberg is not because Matthew Rosenberg writes a fantastic grifter. So why would he kill off one of his favorite characters? Um, so there's a mystery going on, multiversal stuff, which makes sense because, you know, Wildcats merging uh, with the DC universe, the Wildstorm universe, all that sort of thing, which DC has struggled with um, and has tried to incorporate them at various times. And it's worked to not very good success, I have to be honest. Um, I mean, they even put Martian Manhunter and Stormwatch in, in the new 52. And so... Um, but I will say that watching the, this new, uh, seven soldiers or magnificent seven or whatever they're called, uh, seeing them meet Superman and majestic fight with Superman was pretty fun. Um, Spartan 
really has a chance to shine in this issue as well. So there's there's things to like, uh, including this new kind of version of um, of Death Blow, where Michael Cray's like consciousness and memories and personality and thoughts gets transferred from you know one body to another, uh, and he's currently in the body of a woman, which I I just it's fantastic and. Uh, you know, who would ever have thought Michael Cray would be sexy, but there you go. Uh, and yeah, like I said, Spartan has a chance to shine um, in this issue as well. So a lot to like with the story. Um, it just felt for me that the art let me down a little bit, this this particular issue. Um, and also, if I have to nitpick, which I don't have to, but I'm going to, um, the one other thing uh, you and I both just and we keep going back to it. We both really loved the grifter story that Matthew Rosenberg told uh, when Batman urban legends kicked off. And that one of the things that was so great about that was it was a fast paced story, but it wasn't too fast. It didn't feel choppy. It flowed very well. Um, and maybe it's cause he knew, he, you know, he was limited to those six, those six parts. Um, this feels like it's taking its time, maybe a little bit too much. Um, so I wish the plot were moving just a little bit faster. But again, it's a nitpick, um, kind of like I'm nitpicking on the art a little bit. But overall, I'm enjoying uh, this Wildcat series more so than any Wildcat series I've enjoyed since probably, you know, the original, which got pretty good when it started coming out on time when Jim Lee was no longer drawing it, um, like in the 20s, 25, 26, right around there. Um, so, yeah. Uh, that's my thoughts on Wildcats. What do you think? I thought that the uh, I've been enjoying. I've still been enjoying this. Generally speaking, I, th I think that the Matthew Rosenberg. I think he's he struggles a little bit sometimes handling all these characters. But uh, I'm still invested enough in this story that I'm really curious as to know as to where it's headed. We know that Cole Cash. Uh, we, we, it was hinted at last issue. It was confirmed this issue uh, through Voodoo when she examines the body of Cole Cash that it's actually a body from another universe. So it involves multiverse shenanigans that uh, the, the Cole Cash that likely died or the corpse is a Cole Cash from another universe or has different multiversal energies. We've, we've seen that multiversal sort of thing play out even in the pages of Zardaski's Batman. Uh, here we have Zealot, Deathblow, and Caitlin. They, at the beginning, they're investigating Cole uh, grifter's apartment and they discover that there's a connection between the, the leader of the wildcats marlo marlo's one of marlo's good friends is jason halliday but jason halliday seems to be working and maybe potentially betraying marlo because at the end we have actually war warblade show up when when death blow uh michael cray who's in the body of a woman now con confronts jason halliday she ends up uh, she he ends up getting killed by Warblade, and uh, and then in in between all this, we have a Superman getting involved in an altercation with Majestic, and because Majestic made the comment last issue that he's Kryptonian. Uh, one of my one of my comments is, I I forget the the origin of Majestic. I'm gonna have to Google it. I never had time to because I plain plump forgot, and. Majestic thinks he's Kryptonian. Superman tells him he's not. And I wish there was more clarification on, on that aspect from uh, Matthew Rosenberg himself. I'm not really sure how or how... Why is Majestic in this comic? Why is he showing up? Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit unclear as to... We don't exactly... These characters are just there. We've been sort of really dumped in the middle of these Wildcats. And now we got, we got Wildcats. we got the, a brand new Seven Soldiers of Victory. we uh, we got Superman making an appearance. Spartan confronting Superman. But it was very short-lived. It feels very forced. Superman has a very limited appearance. Spartan shows up just to take Superman off the playing field to give us just uh, the Wildcats time to, to, to take Majestic away and basically basically to escape being held accountable by Superman. Uh, so I think things are moving very, very, very quickly. There's a lot of moving parts here. And Matthew Rosenberg is kind of always hit and miss on that. Some, some issues are better than others. It's a little bit hit and miss here. I hope this doesn't end up like his, the, uh, the Joker, the man who stopped laughing, because that, that's ended up being a, a real mess at the end. Uh, but I'm still enjoying this. I just hope he reels, uh, he reels it in a little bit more and tightens up the uh, plot line and we don't get too wonky on, on some of the plot points. Um, but um, because I felt 
know, that, that happened with Task Force X as well with uh, his work on that. But in any event, I'm, I'm happy enough with it. The Segovia art, I, I understand your comments about that. It does seem a little bit different, uh, but it's still workable and I'm, I'm still enjoying the story. So overall, I, I didn't mind it. Yeah, Majestic, uh, and here's the thing, like a lot of these Wildcats, their backstory has changed. You know, Michael Cray being uh, chief among them, and we, you know, got kind of his new origin in that uh, Wildstorm 30th anniversary one shot, which we just loved. Um, but originally, like his original origin, he, he it was the, what is it, Car Caribbean uh, Damonite War. He became trapped on Earth. Right. Um, so he was all wrapped up in that. Um, he comes from a planet, I think it's pronounced Kara. It's uh, C-H-E-R-A, I believe. Right. So there's some similarities between him and Superman, but yeah, he's definitely not Kryptonian, but yeah, clearly Marlowe with a cover story and, you know, who knows what his true origin is. Maybe we'll get it yeah. at, at some point. So Yeah, because yeah, it is a plot point. Like, why does he think he's Kryptonian then? Because that kind of yeah. threw me off and it was, it's really weird because uh, I, you know, I didn't know where that was coming from, but in, in any yeah, event. Knowing Marlowe, he brainwashed him into thinking that he is Kryptonian, so... Mm. Uh, all right. Next up, I'm gonna and I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you go first because I I think you really really enjoyed this. So it's Superman Lost number one, um, and it's it's written by, well, I should say that it, it's credited as um, Christopher Priest handling the plot and the scripting, so do, doing the actual dialogue. Carlo Pagulian, who's doing the uh, line work, is also credited with plot. So uh, apparently Christopher Priest and, and Pagulian, who P Pagulian, you know, longtime DC artist, fantastic work with uh, Christopher Priest on Deathstroke. So it's kind of, a, a, the, you know, getting the band back together, if you will. And so I, I'm sure with that previous collaboration that um, – Priest is is really open to Carlo's ideas. So it's great to see Carlo getting plot credit as well as line work. Jason Paz handles the inks, Jeremy Cox on colors, and Willie Schubert on letters. Uh, and this is a 10-issue mini, I believe, or maxi-series. So um, what'd you think? Uh, I thought that this was a, uh, this was a good setup issue. Uh, it, it was a decent setup issue. Not a lot happens. Very, I thought it was very classic Christo <laughs> um, Christopher Priest in, in, in that respect. Uh, it, it, it really is just, uh, it deals a lot almost with, with uh, well, I mean, let me just give you the, the basic setup here is it starts off with Superman rescue a, rescuing uh, a woman who, uh, who, from a traffic accident and in the trunk of her car is millions of dollars. That's tied in with a political, with, with a political intrigue and maybe some political corruption and that Lois Lane is working on a story and Clark Kent and Lois Lane are just talking about uh, a story that she's working on. And they just, they just have a conversation. Superman then flies off to help the justice league. And then he comes back uh, while he finds Lois, you know, Lois Lane falls asleep at her laptop as Superman goes off and helps the Justice League. And when Superman, su when Lois Lane wakes up from her, wakes up falling asleep at her laptop, she looks and she sees Superman just standing in the room, staring blankly ahead. And it's discovered, he reveals that in fact, he's been gone for 20 years and Superman is just sort of, he's adjusting to the moment. He's adjusting to the fact that, my God, he's been gone for 20 years and, and, uh, this is where I just very quickly blurted out half the issue already. But the the, the power of this this opening issue that I will give uh, the writers credit for is, uh, along with the artist, is that it feels like Superman has had an emotional impact because you can see that Superman is stunned. He's been gone for 20 years and it's because he goes and, and it's revealed in the latter half of the issue that Superman essentially helped the Justice League deal with a, a singularity that was created by an object that fell into the ocean outside the China Sea. And while they thought they were preventing World War III and they thought this was maybe uh, some sort of uh, bomb uh, involved, uh, involving some of the various members of China, United States, et cetera, et cetera. It ended up being some sort of alien object that fell into the ocean and it ended up creating a singularity and all the members of the Justice League sort of tethered themselves to Superman. Superman had to go into the singularity, preventing it from ex essentially exploding, swallowing up the earth. And in doing so, Superman got transported to another part of the universe. But yet at the end, it's quite clear that Superman has already made it back to earth 
but it's 20 years later. And so the central setup of this storyline would appear to be that we know that Superman is going to be, that the, the, the rest of the nine issues, this is 10 issues long, the rest of the nine issues presumably be, will be Superman telling the story of where he was for, for 20 years and how he made it back to Earth essentially only 10 minutes after he was swallowed up in that singularity. And there was quite the moment here where, where Bruce Wayne, Batman, you know, he, he shows up at Lois Lane's apartment to give her the bad news that we lost Superman into a singularity. And he is shocked to find Superman back at the apartment. So, you know, this is a surprise. And what, what, what I, where this issue does work, I think from, a, I can feel the, gra I felt the gravity of the situation. And uh, for that reason, I got to give uh, full props to, full props to the uh, artist, uh, uh, plot, uh, plot and art, uh, Carlo Pagulon and Jason Paz on the inks. I really felt, I really felt that that the Superman was gone that long, and I, I felt for Superman. And so I'm really curious now to where Superman went. How did he make it back? And how does this affect uh, Superman psychologically? Because you know Lois Lane is there to support him, saying, "Okay, you know, tell me what happened." And well, you know, it's interesting because. You know, one of the potential criticisms of this of this story is that, well, you could say that we already know what happened, right? Well, Superman's gone for 20 years. Well, we know he makes it back, okay, so what's at stake? You know, if we if we know Superman made it back, okay, aren't the nine issues that we're going to be getting superfluous? Well, I'm thinking not, because I think that there's a deeper story to be told here, because Christopher Priest makes some very, I think, intentional references during that converse, early conversation with Lois Lane and Clark. Lois Lane is referencing uh, some, some. Um, uh, he, she referenced a Danish theologian named Soren Kierkegaard, he was a poet and social critic, and he's a guy that talks about anxiety and despair and melancholy and and repetition. And he believed everyone would die, but the soul goes on forever. And and I and I think that, you know, she she's referencing the these these different writers as she's doing her own article. And I'm wondering is if. Can we expect that type of social anxiety and despair and loneliness and emptiness to be experienced by Superman? This is called Superman Lost after all. And so I think there's hints in the narrative that Christopher Priest uh, might be going dark. He might be exploring the, the idea of loneliness and solitude uh, in, in regard to Superman in a way that uh, one might normally associate with Tom King. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm really curious to see where this is going. I'm, I'm hope I can't imagine it's going to be boring, uh, but Christopher Priest has my attention. Uh, whether or not he'll have my compliments by the end of this story, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, what do you say? What, what do you think? Yes, I, just super mixed feelings about this. Um, <clears throat> no, you, you said it yourself. Like, so where's the stakes, right? We know Superman comes back. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you kill Superman off, you know he's going to come back. Uh, it's comics. Superman's never really going to be gone. Um, which, you know, you think back to the milestone moments when Superman actually was killed off in 92 and they, you know, oh, we're going to replace him. Here's the four possibilities. No, Superman was always going to come back. Electric Superman, some people hated it. It was always going to revert. And maybe the best example is, you know, Doc Ock taping over Spider-Man's body and Peter Parker no more and Dan Slott, you know, swearing on the Holy Bible that it was, that was how it was going to be for all time. No, 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 no. These are billion dollar properties more so than ever in the hands of, you know, multinational corporations that are not going to ruin their IP by letting a writer change something. So yeah, the, the stakes may be, you know, lowered because he already comes back. Um, but yeah, like you said, the, the moment illustrated, so beautifully by Pagulian, uh, you know, directed by Priest, Superman just standing there quiet for so long, and it juxtaposed against Lois kind of chattering away to sort of illustrate, for her, it's just an everyday occurrence. Oh, she even mentions, hey, that was quick. You know, as far as missions go, you're only gone for a couple of hours, you know, and he's just trying to adjust. For him, it's been 20 years. Um, so that's that's fascinating. The other thing I think about is of course uh, Christopher Priest can never, much like Tom King, can never just tell a linear story. He's always going to flash back and forth, and it can be a little confusing at times. But 
Um, I think it's worth the payoff if, if you pay attention. Uh, so this is sort of the perfect way for him to tell any kind of Superman stories he, he's had in his back pocket, right, that he's been wanting to tell for a long time because he's got 20 years of Superman history that he can play with within a 10 uh, issue series. What, did Superman spend all this time alone? Did he have another, I mean, he could have had another family at that time. He, you know, he's out there traveling. Priest can do anything, right? Like the, the way he set it up, he's given himself a lot of creative freedom to tell any kind of story he can. But again, there's still part of me that goes, but so, so what? He's back. So, and he's Superman. So would he really, I mean, he's, we don't know how long he'll live uh, because you know, Kryptonians on their own planet were very long lived, living hundreds of years, especially if you take the burn uh, continuity where they had failing parts of their body replaced by clones. Um, but he's a Kryptonian on Earth and his cells don't age or die. So could he functionally be immortal? If he is, then how long really is 20 years? Um, so, yeah, there's, you know, there's so much to think about when you, you talk about it in, the, in those terms. But, you know, I guess, I guess, like you said, we'll have to wait and see how it all plays out. It is interesting that, you know, Priest does like to put a lot of politics in his book. Just go read his Black Adam series. Um, <laughs> but if this series is going to be Superman kind of telling Lois, here's what I went through over the 20 years, um, where does her part come in with this political intrigue? So it's, I imagine it's going to have to tie in um, – in some respects. And then the other kind of thing you can throw in as sort of a, a wild card is that Christopher Priest likes to kind of blow everything up in terms of his story. He th you think it's going one direction. This seems a simple premise. Superman got sucked into a singularity. He's gone for 20 years. He comes back. He's emotional about it. For uh, Lois, he's only been gone a few hours. That's an interesting dichotomy with plenty of story idea. But it's kind of easy to understand and somewhat straightforward, even though Priest is going to jump around in the timeline uh, chronologically and it's not going to be told, you know, ABC. He's, he always throws in other things as well. So what he might have in store, I don't know. Um, but as I said, Carlo Pagulian and Priest did a fantastic job on Deathstroke. And here they're reunited on somebody who, in terms of power level, is far beyond Deathstroke much more traditional, super heroic character. Uh, and Pagulian is up to the task. This art is fantastic. Not only does he draw Superman in this issue, he draws Wonder Woman, he draws Flash, Aquaman, Green Lantern, Batman, like the whole league. So it's wonderful. He does a fantastic job, just gorgeous. Um, and I sure hope that DC gave these guys plenty of time to work on this and he, and Pagulian's ahead of the game. I don't want anyone to fill in. I only want Pagulian to see Pagulian's line work and art on this because it's gorgeous. Um, and yeah, credit to his longtime inking collaborator, Jason Paz, because the inks and the textures are wonderful as well. So uh, we'll have to wait and see how it all plays out. And the one other thing that I'll add is I love this idea of Superman being thrown so far out, it takes him 20 years to get back. But at the same time, and again, I know this may not necessarily be in continuity, it doesn't explicitly say Black Label, over in the pages of Action Comics right now, Superman is so powerful <laughs> in the hands of Philip Kenny Johnson that he could have covered that distance in a in a millisecond, right? Um, but could he have been distracted along the way? Oh, it took him that long to get back home because he kept having to stop to help people. Um, you know, you could see that. Maybe he was part of a war that lasted, you know, a decade or, or what have you. So plenty of extenuating circumstances. But even this story which, yeah, Superman was gone for 20 years. This does feel like a more powerful Superman than the post-crisis Superman we're, uh, we're used to, to having. But, yeah, I, I enjoyed it, but a little bit of mixed feelings. Jury's still out uh, for me on this, whether I'm going to uh, like it or not. But at the end of the day, I, I generally like what Christopher Priest does. And what has me most intrigued, perhaps, is, like I said, the setup for the story really sets Priest up to tell any sort of Superman story he wants to tell. So we'll see how it all plays out. Uh, all right. Up next, we have Batman Incorporated number six, This Little Piggy, part one. Ed Brisson is the writer. Michelle Bandini 
is the artist Rex Locus on colors, Clay Cal on letters. I'll start off with the art uh, again on this one. Uh, just It was a really interesting art week in terms of the art was noticeable, both in ways where it didn't, it didn't necessarily work for me and in ways where it really did work for me. And the art here really worked for me. I don't want anybody else on Batman Incorporated but Michelle Banditi after this issue. Um, the other thing that really stood out to me is <clears throat> we are starting to get in this particular issue a few more character moments for the different members of Batman Incorporated, um, whether they're playing off each other like El Gaucho and Ghostmaker are here, or whether it's um, Red Raven and, and uh, Hero talking about Ghostmaker and whether or not he's he's the right one to be the leader for Batman Incorporated. So it's giving him more of a personality. Uh, we get some character moments for Clown Hunter as well, which I could have done without because, again, I just think he's such a, a throwaway character. Um, and Ghostmaker doesn't have a very high opinion of him either, which is mentioned in this issue. But I really enjoyed the, the dialogue, those character moments, because uh, and it's especially true when we have the scene with Grey Wolf and the Knight. They're in the middle of investigating um, uh, Professor Pig. They're in Gotham City. Professor Pig has had something stolen from him, and he's kind of burning the underworld down and taking out other criminals, attacking people, torturing people, trying to find what was stolen from them. So Batman Incorporated is, is uh, trying to stop all the, the violence and mayhem and fi find out what was stolen from Professor Pig and, and you know, solve this mystery and get this violence uh, stopped. And so while Grey Wolf and Knight are investigating that, Ed Brisson does such a fantastic job of having them carry on two conversations at once, sort of, just like you do in real life with a, with a friend, right? Like you guys are working together on something, um, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, maybe you're, you're landscaping your yard or you're building a tree house or something, and you, but you're also talking about something else, you know, conversation about a video game or a movie, but then interspersed in there, you're like, oh, you know, this two by four needs to go over here and that. So it's that sort of thing. And it, it comes across as very, uh, feeling very real gives a sense of realism. And again, a, a lot of that character work that I talked about, which is so fantastic. So I can say unequivocally without question, this is my favorite Professor Pig story I've ever read. Um, Cause I even enjoy the characterization of Professor Pig that we get from Ed Brisson. P Professor Pig to me has always been a villain. I, I can't, <laughs> the whole idea of it, of him wearing a pig mask and being a just an insane guy. It feels kind of derivative, you know, like we already have plenty of Batman villains that are insane. We really need one that dresses like a pig uh, or wears a pig mask. Um, <laughs> he's never really worked for me as a character at all. Um, so it's so interesting what Brisson does in a way he's understated, you know, he doesn't come across as quite so scattered, but clearly still crazy but very threatening, very formidable. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a sort of a, a distillation of Professor Pig down to the things I think that make, that do make him work um, really well. So like, usually when I see Professor Pig is the villain in a book, I, it's a struggle for me to read it. I'm like, oh my God, this can't end soon enough. Um, but I'm really enjoying this. And when we find out, and I'll let you talk about it, Rocky, when we find out what was stolen from Professor Pig, um, it's kind of almost a holy crap moment for the guys who thought they were just stealing a couple million bucks in this safe that they took. Um, and then when you find out what it is, you're like, oh, crap. Um, so, yeah, that was interesting as well. Uh, so, yeah, I I'm, I'm really enjoying it. For me, this is the best issue of Batman Incorporated so far because – we're starting to get character work for the this, and it's a huge team, right? And it's a real challenge. And, and Rocky and I both talked about how the, the you know editorial or whoever it was didn't do the best job of making sure we understand who these characters are, uh, because in the first arc, not only do we have all the Batman Incorporated uh, characters, we had the group they were going up against, which had like eight characters. So it's so hard to keep things straight. So at least this time we just have Professor Pig. Easy to keep track of who the antagonist is. 
and maybe gives a little more space for Brisson to work on some character work for the, the Batman Incorporated members. So uh, what do you think? Uh, well, Professor Pig, uh, apparently he's really brought his A game. I've never known Professor Pig to be as competent as he apparently is in this issue. I mean, he, he pretty much captures a, a fair chunk of Batman's rogues gallery because he's so upset that somebody stole this, stole his prize, stole stole what ends up being, I don't even know what the hell it is, the big reveal at the end uh, ap ap appears to be somebody, uh, does, is that anarchy? Is that the body no, of anarchy? He says, it's his, he says it's his mother. Yeah, I, I don't know who it is, but it's it's really weird and uh, it ends up, it's you know. It's his mom. Yeah. Why is his mom dressed like that? Yeah, I, is that what he called? But I, I thought that was. I thought I know he said the word mom, but I didn't actually think it was his literal mother. But uh, yeah, I just, says, you know, when you get between, uh, or uh, I'm afraid there's always a price to pay when you get between a boy and his mother. Yeah, I. Well, you know, Professor. Yeah, I. Fair enough. I, it doesn't look like a mother. I. Anyways, I'm. 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 I'm clued out. I bet. But I mean, am, am I kind of curious about it? Sure. I. I will say that. It's uh, the issue interested, you know, the, the interest got going, the my interest got going right away when Professor Pig seems to have the Riddler, you know, tied up and is threatening to kill him. And then obviously it's revealed later that he's got he's got uh, other members of Batman's rogues that he's threatening to do harm to if they don't tell him where uh, where his prize is. And he's got, uh, Miss, you know, Mad Hatter, Mr. Freeze, Riddler, Firefly, Kite Man, Killer Croc. They're all captured by Professor Pig. Uh, that's kind of interesting. I'm surprised Pro Professor Pig could pull that off. Meanwhile, Ghostmaker uses this as a, as a way. He, he, Ghostmaker tells El Gacho that, you know, he, he basically sends all of Batman Incorporated on what is essentially different investigatory paths to try to find Professor Pig, but he already knows where, he already knows where Professor Pig is, and which is kind of funny. But as he tells El Gacho, he just does that because he wants the team to gel. He wants the team to get to get accustomed to each other. So Raven Red and and Hero. Uh, uh, you know, they, they work together well as a team uh, and um, Knight and Grey Wolf track down uh, some, you know, they put together some reported robberies and they discover uh, whoever it was who stole from Professor Pig was waiting for waiting for him. And and then there's a reference to Marvin, Marvin George's Pizza Parlor, uh, which is, I think, a, a tribute to Marv Wolfman and George Perez. So there's some Easter eggs here as well. And nice, there's some nice callbacks there. Clown Hunter uh, talks to some local kids and he discovers that a couple kids have gone missing and it's ultimately those kids that have gone missing that find this secret cargo containing the quote mother of um professor pig that is revealed at the end so it's um uh, i found that uh, i agree with you that they're they're uh Ed Brisson, writer Ed Brisson, does a good job here of, surprisingly enough, there's still a lot of players, but he, he I think he writes all these players. He's getting a better handle on, on all of them now. I find it, I still find it challenging sometimes to remember who all these characters are, uh, but but I'm getting better at it because it is, it is, after all, the sixth issue, so at some point it's my fault if I don't know who the characters are, <laughs> and I acknowledge that. But I did read this issue twice, and uh, I'm glad I did because I did get more of an appreciation out of it uh, the second time. And um, I do say that it's interesting comparing Ed Brisson to Matthew Rosenberg. I, I think that, boy, they're, they're very similar and because they, they both have similar challenges in working with a lot of players uh, with Rosenberg on Wildcats and Ed Brisson on, go, uh, uh, on uh, Batman Incorporated. I, I would have to say slight, that Ed Brisson is slightly better at maybe handling more characters than, than uh, Matthew Rosenberg is uh, at this point. But they're, I'm still enjoying both of their stories because uh i'm mindful of the challenge they have up uh they they they've taken uh, up that they've uh, accepted and and i agree with you it's been a while since i saw professor pig be this interesting a character and really he seems like a more dominating and fearful uh character than he than he has in a lot of past stories that he's been involved in he's more than just some disgraceful disgusting looking individual in a in a pig mask he actually feel like he you know there's actually the way he's drawn by a uh, michelle uh, uh michael bandini here he looks intimidating as hell in some of these uh some of these illustrations so it's 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 overall, it's it's pretty good. Uh, I did, this was one of my uh, out of the four. I said I enjoyed four comics this week. This was one of them. 
Yeah, I, I agree. He just he doesn't come across as being so crazy that it feels like he, you know, is incompetent, which is how he's always felt to me. Um, like, how does he get anything done? Why would anybody follow him? <laughs> you know, so anyway, yeah, good issue. Uh, all right. Up next, we have. Uh, oh, sorry. I accidentally closed it. Um, Danger Street, number four. This is from writer Tom King. Uh, I'm just waiting for the <clears throat> issue to load since I accidentally closed it. Jorge Fornes is the artist. Um, sorry, it's taken a little while to load. This is another one that I had a chance to read several times. Um, and then Rocky and I actually were texting back and forth this morning because I wasn't clear on, uh, on one part of it. But the thing that continues to stand out to me about this book is how these, you know, zealous characters that Tom King from uh, First Issue Special, uh, that Tom King has put in this book that he meant, and he's, you know, they feel so disparate, whether it be Lady Cop or Green Team or the Dingbats of Danger Street themselves, uh, the Creeper, um, to, to bring, all, you know, Warlord, the, the blue skin version of Starman, to bring all these characters together and tell not only a story that makes sense, but that is compelling and is interesting. And the way they weave, the, the characters weave in and out of each other and the way everything is sort of heading toward sort of a collision course. Um, Orion is another character in the book. It, it's just, it's fascinating to me. Um, and it really shows Tom King's love for uh, for DC overall. So as I mentioned, Tom King's writer, Jorge Fornes, artist, Dave Stewart handles the colors, Clayton Callan letters. Um, and it is, we should say, it is a black label book because you do see some, um, not that people are necessarily saying, oh no, you know, good looks died. How can they kill off good looks? Well, don't worry, they'll bring him back. Uh, it's a comic death. Um, <laughs> Same thing with uh, Grandmaster. We see the death of Grandmaster. Grandmaster being uh, somebody who debuted in the Millennium event way back in 1987 as kind of the, the leader of the Manhunters, um, which was you know one individual and then turned out to, to be uh, a precursor to the the Green Lantern Corps created by the Guardians of the Universe, and then you know that whole Millennium story about different people were. Uh, sleeper agents and yeah it was back the way they did crossovers back then which I honestly I prefer to the way they do them now um, but then King is also mixing in sort of some current ideas of conservatism and you know fear of uh, the unknown in terms of aliens and that sort of thing um, using the creeper as sort of an analog for almost like a Fox News type personality um, this idea of outsiders, which is, you know, another uh, classic DC team. So, um, again, for, for Tom to be really weaving all these characters together uh, in such a fantastic way, it is so, so interesting to me. Um, I, I'm, I'm continually hooked and it's not like I can point to like one event in this book where you're just like, Oh my God, that was so profound uh, to, to bring all these characters together and to have the cohesive narrative and to feel like this is, you know, you might look at it and say, well, that's an incredible coincidence. Like for instance, at one point, one of the dingbats is walking down the street and he just happens to spot warlord and Starman, you know, driving by in a car. Um, but it doesn't feel out of place. It doesn't feel like, oh my God, you know, that, that could never happen. It feels like it's all sort of destined to play out this way. And then uh, as Rocky and I have talked about before, the first panel of every issue, last panel of every issue being that Dr. Fate helm, that's sort of the, the narrator and giving it sort of this medieval fairy tale sort of uh, feeling. Uh, we saw that sort of idea of a, a fable um, in a Tom King series that, Rocky mentioned earlier, the, the Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow, where it was flowery language and what have you, and it, it just worked really, really well. So King is becoming a real master at that, a uh, master of giving these stories, giving these books uh, sort of an overall feel 
just in the vocabulary, just in the word choice that he uses. So it's hard to overstate how well he does that. And then the uh, Jorge Fornes art, you know, his art, which I first saw on a crime noir series um, called Hot Lunch Special that was an Aftershock series, his art is so grounded, right? Like you would ne- I would never say Jorge Fornes art is like traditionally super heroic. No, it's, it's in that David Mazzucchelli style, you know, um, the Frank Miller Batman year one, if, if you're not familiar or the Mazzucchelli daredevil stuff, it's, it's realistic. It's grounded. It doesn't feel over the top and uh, it gives a realism to the story and to these characters that in, in the hands of another artist that maybe was really super heroic or really flamboyant over the top, I think it would feel a little more fake, if you know what I mean. Um, but Fornes is the perfect choice uh, for this uh, this story. So, you know, we've seen, we know Tom King, He uh, he's a very bankable name for DC. I know he gets a lot of hate online, but trust me, that's the vocal minority because his books do sell really, really well. Um, so it's not a surprise that he gets matched up with top, top artists, but usually what happens is once somebody works with Tom King, then Tom's like, okay, I want them. And then he does more and more projects like Mitch Garrett's. I can't remember the last time he drew something that wasn't, you know, Tom King, same thing with Clay Mann, um, Jorge Fornes and Tom King obviously worked together on Rorschach. And, you know, one thing I forgot to mention, we were talking about Wonder Woman earlier, now Daniel Samper. <laughs> and I feel like, okay, now Samper is going to be in that Tom King stable. Um, and I'm totally fine with that. Like if, if Tom and Daniel are just become a, a team, um, yeah, that they can definitely drive some sales, I would think. So anyway, uh, yeah, Danger Street number four, really impressed. I continue to be impressed by this series, with how well it's, it's so, it's so good technically, um, that you can almost overlook how interesting the story is, but, uh, the quality of the story quality of uh, you know the technical aspect of the book pacing both narratively and visually yeah it's it's just really 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 good um i you know i wouldn't necessarily put it in the same league with human target but technically it is you know technically the the pacing the visual storytelling the the transitions artistically from panel to panel you know Human Target may be the most perfect comic I've read since I can remember. Um, technically speaking, Danger Street is is almost right there with it um, from a technical standpoint. The story might not be quite as interesting or as emotional or didn't pull doesn't pull me in as much. It's still just as enjoyable. Um, you know, they're completely different. But from a technical aspect, this comic is is up there uh, in quality. So, uh, which again, it's with these B and C not even B, C, D, X, Y, Z list characters. So fascinating to see what King can do. So um, anyway, you probably didn't enjoy it as much as me, but what did you think? Uh, no, I, I I love this issue. I think this is arguably, I think, probably my favorite issue uh, to date out of the since it began. Uh, There's so many moments in this issue that uh, stood out to me that just really nail the the narrative. It's really starting to come together, this issue. Uh, As you said, uh, all these these disparate uh, characters that you wonder how on earth could they possibly be connected and uh, it's really starting to come together we know we know the dingbats of danger street lost one of their own they're just a they're a small young gang uh, of uh, kids that live on danger street and one of their own was accidentally killed by starman as starman and warlord were trying to draw out dark side in in order to impress the justice league and become members of the justice league starman this blue skin superhero accidentally kills one of these dingbat kids and these dingbat kids are swearing an oath that they want to find this blue skinned person and kill him to avenge the death of their of their friend and they uh, and and it's quite quite the moment here at one point in this issue where these dingbat kids discover that the guy they're looking for is a superhero named starman oh my god we we have to we're gonna we have to kill a superhero i mean they're, they're shocked by this meanwhile uh, meanwhile we know that we got this uh, jp houston this green team this this group of evil young kid bastards billionaires who are tr- are are basically uh 
cajoling uh, Jack Ryder, so sort of like the Tucker Carlson here, to uh, create sort of a conspiracy theory against the outsiders as they this green team works, uh, has a codename assassin working for them, doing their machinations, trying to manipulate things. Uh, and we have uh, Manhunter, uh, Manhunter, who ends up killing one of the green team members here. <laughs> and ends up talking to Codename Assassin. So Manhunter works for, is the is Mark Shaw, uh, the same Mark Shaw who is uh, would become Leviathan, but this is Black Label, so don't let, Tom King never lets continuity bother him. So um, this, Mark Sh this Mark Shaw character is the Manhunter. His father is revealed to be the Grandmaster here, and their their nemesis here is Codename Assassin, uh, that terrible, terribly named uh, series from the 1970s, the one-shot spe special. And we, so we have the situation where Lady Cop now is involved. She's looking for who murdered one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, dingbats of Danger Street. She is also looking for a blue skinned person. She, it's revealed here. Why doesn't she call in Superman? Why doesn't she, why doesn't she, a, a fellow cop asks Lady Cop in this issue, why don't you, why don't you ask Superman for help? And, and she says, well, you know, she says something very, very poignant. She said, she asked Superman for help once. Uh, but she was, uh, she says, I was under a bed. I called his name. You know, she's hinting at a trauma that she experienced when she was younger, where she called out for help. And it, and it was the, that same trauma inspired her to become a cop. And all this with so little dialogue, Tom King reveals so much character work with so little dialogue and just amazing art by uh, Jose Fornes and beautiful colors by Dave Stewart. All of this comes out in the narrative, and it's so well done. And even at the end here, Grandmaster, codename Assassin, approaches Grandmaster, who in his spare time goes and watches a movie at a theater. He ends up getting murdered. I mean, there's uh, there's so much. This issue ends with two members of the green team dead, one killed by Manhunter, one killed presumably by possibly the Creeper or somebody else. Grandmaster is killed by Codename Assassin. Jack Ryder is playing along because he's threatened by one of the Green Team members to, to further the false narrative that the outsiders are causing these problems. Lady Cop is preparing for a confrontation with who she thinks will be a superhero. Uh, and Warlord and Starman are, at are attacked by Orion. All this is coming together in this one issue. And if you've been reading the issues up to this point, it's like, oh my God, this is really good stuff. This reminds me like one of those British movies like Snatch, where it's it's so fast paced, like all these different crazy psychotic narratives. You're thinking like, it's almost like a Quentin Tarantino movie. How are these plot lines possibly connected? And yet they're coming together in a, just a kinetic, schizophrenic, psychedelic kind of way. And goddamn if it doesn't work. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm in, I'm just curious as hell to see how this is going to end. But I I quite I quite enjoyed this. Yeah, I mean you're right uh, to compare it to those type of movies like Snatch or um, Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, where you know all these disparate storylines and then in the end they all tie together so perfectly. So, uh, all right, moving on. Batgirls number sixteen. This is from writers Becky Cloonan and Michael W. Conrad. Neil Gouge on art, uh, along with. Uh, Geraldo Borges doing the finishes on pages 16 through 22. Rico Renzi on colors. Becca Carey on letters. Um, you know, I've said before, Rico Renzi, he's done some things, um, or, or uh, sorry, Neil Gouge, the artist on this, he's done some things here that, um, you know, previously when he was following um, Jorge Corona, it felt like his art was really juvenile. He, it's less juvenile. It's still not my favorite style of art, but it's less juvenile. And we've talked about this so much with this book, kind of how it feels like it's aimed at young readers, but yet it's um, just based on the art style, but yet it's, uh, you know, clearly uh, adult subject matter. I'll give Gouge credit here for having that more mature style that really works. As far as the issue itself, it feels a little bit like a throwaway, but I'm still enjoying the tone uh, with this a little feeling like a little bit more of a mature theme. And what's so interesting about it and what's really working for me regarding that is that with that more mature style of art, you have a contrast between the way that the girls, the way that these bad girls are in terms of their kind of personalities, if you will, um, which... I feel like it makes for a more 
interesting story. Um, just having this idea of them feeling young, they can feel young. The art is mature. The story feels mature. They're clearly young. They're still learning. Now, you know, we can debate whether that should be the case because, you know, Cassandra Cain has been around for a long time and, you know, very mature DC hero and, and what have you. So, you know, that, you know, I don't know if that, if that makes sense. Um, but I, I, I don't know. There was something about this issue that it, it just really worked for me in terms of that contrast. The first time I felt like, well, yeah, you know, they do make mistakes, whatever they are still learning. Stephanie much more so than Cassandra Cain, but um, it still works for me on that level. So, um, and yeah, uh, the Neil Gujart, like I said, I thought he did a fantastic job this, this issue. So um, anyway, I, I know you haven't been a big fan of the series. So what, what were your thoughts on this particular issue? Well, I'm not going to, I mean, uh, y- you mentioned it and I'm going to, I'll add to it that, you know, I mean, at this point, yeah, it's, it's not my cup of tea, this interpretation of, of Cassandra Cain. I was never a Stephanie Brown fan, and I'm, I'm certainly still not. Um, uh, although I will say, even when I wasn't a Stephanie Brown fan, I preferred her previous iteration to this one. And I, uh, <laughs> But it, it is what it is. Clearly, the, the idea here is to, is to focus on, is to create a friendship between Cassandra Cain and Stephanie Brown. And to that extent, I think that the Clooner ads have, have been successful. Uh, I, I still think the stories have been wonky and what have you, but clearly it's that, that, that they're friends. And this issue sort of really doubles down on that. It makes it clear that, uh, that they're friends. It, it's established that Mad Hatter is the person that stole Lazarus Resin that resurrected Clue Master. Uh, who is uh, Stephanie Brown's father. And that was that Clue Master storyline took place last issue, which we reviewed. And, um, and uh, in, in, a, in a plot, in a series of, of events, which uh, I, I just, I felt were very unnatural. Mad Hatter, for some odd reason, decides to throw man bat serum at Stephanie Brown, changes her into sort of a man bat or a female bat. And, Cassandra Cain talks about friendship and how great their friendship is, and that somehow talks Stephanie Brown down from being a crazy man bat creature, and um, and it it ends with Cass- Cassandra Cain literally on the back of a man bat Stephanie Brown, and we don't even see the resolution of it. We just we're we're, we're told that Stephanie Brown changes back into Stephanie Brown from a man bat while she's sleeping and she dreamt of flying and. And I think that's the end. Is this is that the end of the series? Is this series now done? Is it over? Uh, you know what? I'm not sure. It very well might be. I, I think it is. I, I you know, I, I don't say this to be cruel, but I hope it is because I, I, I think that this, this, I don't know a lot of people that are reading this. And quite frankly, I, I don't, it's not, it's just not serving any larger purpose for, for either of these characters, quite frankly. And um, it remains an issue uh, that, um, you know, at this point, I, I almost don't even want to disagree with you <laughs> on this point because it's, I, I just feel like I'm beating a dead horse. But I, I do feel that I, I don't know if the art this issue is. I, I quite saw I, I appreciated it as much as you did. I still think that this entire series suffered from a, a disjointed tone between art and storyline and narrative and, and what have you. But I will, I will say that, look, I mean, it did, it did strengthen the friendship between Cassandra Cain and Stephanie Brown. They're now familiar with each other's families. There, there is a bond there that, quite frankly, to put it another way, I do think that, that there is a lot of potential plot points to be expanded upon in a more qualitative way by future writers. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, it's not the final issue. There's 17 and 18 have been solicited already. Oh. Um, don't know if it goes beyond that. So yeah, it's not over yet. Um, <laughs> okay, I will. Yeah, one of the thing uh, I want to mention, um, you know, so often we we criticize art. You know, it's not a don't care for a style, or we don't like what a certain person did, or artistic choice, what have you. And it's all subjective. Um, when the white rabbit was mentioned here, you know, at no point has anybody any artists on Batgirls been what I would say is a traditional superhero artist, you know, closer to that DC house style. It just hasn't happened. And if there's one thing you can say about white rabbit, especially that real famous, uh, David Finch, Richard friend cover. (laughs) cover, Yeah. Um, 
I was expecting that. I was expecting to see a sexy white rabbit in his car and we never, we never got it. Like what a shame. But, but actually when I saw that, I was, I was like, Oh my God, please, Neil Gooch, don't try to draw white rabbit. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, and I don't say that to be mean, but I just, I don't think I would have cared for his interpretation uh, based on his style of art. So I was actually glad (laughs) to not see white rabbit which yeah maybe that's a backhanded compliment or maybe it's a uh a, a mean a mean compliment i don't know yeah uh, all right moving on uh really curious because you know we've had so much to say about tom king on wonder woman uh lazarus planet revenge of the gods number one from writer g willow wilson art is by c and torme colors by jordi belair letters by pat broso g willow wilson had a very brief run on Wonder Woman, if I'm not mistaken. I'm kind of surprised that they don't leverage her more. Clearly, she's known for writing female characters. You know, look at Miss Marvel, currently writing uh, Poison Ivy. Um, this felt a little up and down for me, um, but it is playing off of the events that have been happening in Wonder Woman with Hera murdering Zeus and working with the wizard Shazam. And clearly, uh, Hera is, you know, uh, B-I-T-C-H with a capital B and tricks Wonder Woman into something. Um, Unclear what exactly, but she gets (laughs) elevated to a goddess. Uh, And so, again, I have mixed feelings because it just feels so trite and over-contrived. But at the same time, if you look back on the history of Western civilization, these myths, uh, especially Greek myths, it's rife with gods tricking humans. Now, granted, Wonder Woman is, you know, technically a demi demigod or whatever it should. And and that's where the bad part comes in, right? Like, I I appreciate that it feels classic in terms of having a god trick a mortal. But Wonder Woman is not necessarily immortal, right? And shouldn't she be smarter than this? Um, so again, it feels like this, and again, you know, maybe, maybe it's not G Willow Wilson's all her fault because, you know, this is the hand she was dealt with what others have been doing in the Wonder Woman book. So again, mixed feelings. I thought the art by Siren Torme, C and Torme was really strong. Uh, I am sort of curious to, and maybe curious is not the right word. Maybe I'm just anxious to have, to see what happens, to have this end so it can be over. <laughs> you know what I mean? not necessarily um, wanting a satisfying conclusion more so than I'm just wanting it to be over. Uh, I don't know. So I thought it was okay. I actually, there's a backup as well that we'll talk about after Rocky gives his thoughts on the main story. Uh, But I thought the backup was um, much, much more interesting. So anyway, what what were your thoughts on the main story? (laughs) Well, um... well, actually, you know what, before you, and one more thing, like this is a tie in to Lazarus planet that's over and done with, wasn't very good. <laughs> Can it just be like, why are we dragging it out? And I, I guess DC just figures that, hey, here's a, a way we can maybe get a little bump in sales by putting Lazarus Planet on this actual Wonder Woman story. It doesn't really have anything to do with Lazarus Planet. Uh, yeah. Anyway, go, go ahead. Well, what are you, well what let, let me tell you the uh, uh, rant incoming. Uh, l- l- here's, what, here's what's going to happen here. Uh, the wizard, the connection to Lazarus Planet is that uh, the Lazarus reign affected the wizard. And the wizard now has had a vision that he has foreseen victory for Hera. And particularly Hera's master plan to have revenge of the gods. Because apparently, after Wonder Woman, nonsensically, for reasons which were never given, when Wonder Woman resurrected the Greek gods from the graveyard of the gods, uh, apparently they're all dying. So they, she resurrected them all, only for all of them to find out that they're all dying, because apparently they all need to be worshipped or they're going to lose their power. And uh, apparently all the gods now are dying. And uh, the wizard is going to help Hera have all the Greek, all the gods, not just Greek gods, but uh, all kinds of gods, Egyptian gods, Japanese gods, Icelandic gods. uh, And that's at the beginning of this. They're they're rebelling against mankind. They're very angry with mankind. We have Apollo, god of the sun, who caught uh, shooting arrows like Eros at the beginning. We have Sekhmet, the Egyptian goddess of pestilence and destruction. We have a a, a Tokyo god who's not identified. We've got Skadis, some or Scaddy, Scaddy's uh, some god of Iceland, and uh, she's 
apparently God's, this is the logic of this story. Hera's logic as beautifully, uh, th that's a sarcasm, as, as beautifully stated by Yorafora at one point in this issue, that uh, Yorafora says that, um, she, uh, she says, and I want, I want to get this right here, that without worship, the gods have begun to die and they feed on human belief. And the root of belief is terror. Now, uh, that's utter rubbish and nonsense. That's not true. The root of belief is not terror. We believe in a lot of things. The root of belief is terror. No, it isn't. But you have to believe that you have to believe that hogwash in order to swallow this. Uh, without worship, the gods have begun to die. Well, that's never been the case. And even if I mean, people stopped worshiping the gods a long time ago, but that's a borrowed and boring plot point. It's been done again and again and again. And if the gods are going to die, so what? Furthermore, if the gods are dying, we, this is now we're we're at the, about the fifth or sixth issue now where this plot point of the gods, Hera, wanting to seek revenge on humanity and, and, and force humanity. She thinks that by making humanity fear gods, that fear is just the opposite side of a coin and the other side of fear is love. That fear is the opposite of love, which is also not true. Love has no opposite. But again, let's not, let's not, let's not debate semantics, right? So... We have fear, make humanity fear you, and then somehow convert the fear into worship. Forced worship, by definition, is not worship. But again, that would involve putting, imbuing logic onto a storyline that increasingly makes no sense the more you read this thing. Uh, Hippolyta now is involved as well. Hippolyta became a goddess. Why? She needed to protect Amazonian interests. And, she, and now Hecate is trying to prevent Hippolyta from helping out the Amazons from being a goddess. Furthermore, Wonder Woman, who's supposed to have the wisdom of Athena, decides that as, as the world is being attacked by all these gods gone crazy, Wonder Woman, once again, I mean, how many times, I sound like a broken record when I bitch about Wonder Woman. How many times have I said, when is this woman going to realize that giving a speech is not going to solve a problem? You're not going to solve a problem with a magic lasso. She decides that she's going to go and try to talk to Hera. Wonder Woman thinks that a conversation with the gods, a conversation with Hera, who's always been so reasonable over the last year, hasn't she? She's so reasonable. Let's go have a conversation with Hera. And so there's literally a scene here, I, I shit you not, where Wonder Woman is walking up to Hera and Wonder Woman can see the corpse of her father, Zeus, dead right in front of her. And what does Wonder Woman say? She, she doesn't even react to the fact that her dead father is right in front of her, who's a god. And uh, uh, she doesn't say anything. I mean, I, I, I can't believe she wouldn't say anything. She walks up and she, she, all Wonder Woman says is, why is the king of the gods lying defiled and unburied like a pile of old rags? Really, Wonder Woman? Like, first of all, I don't see Wonder Woman talking like that. Second, this is your father. You, you, you're talking about your, you, instead of old rags, you mean your father, right, Diana? That's your father who's been killed by Hera. And she's still going to embark on having a conversation with her. She actually believes she's going to be able to talk Hera out of it. And then to top it off, Hera tells her something, which is patently ridiculous. She says, well, Wonder Woman says, well, what do I have to do? And Hera says, well, I'll, I'll make you a goddess. Well, and, and, and you nailed it. Wonder Woman's already immortal. Why would she need to become a... She's a demigod. She doesn't need our mentality. Also, Hera confirms something which also is a contradiction to the storyline. Hera is amazed at how easy it is to make people gods. She loves having the power of Zeus now that she's killed Zeus. Well, explain this to me. If all the gods are dying because no one's worshipping them, how can Hera have all this power to just hand out godhood? Why doesn't she go on Oprah Winfrey and just hand out godhood and you can be a god and you can be a god and you can be a god? Why can't everybody be a god, Hera? I mean, and are people really dying? Are the gods really dying from the lack of worship? If you can just make anybody a god? None of this makes any sense. Meanwhile, wizard standing there with his, with his wizard, you know, staff doing absolutely nothing but looking stupid. I mean, this, this entire plot line is absolutely nonsensical. And then, of course, at the end, I mean, what, what was Wonder Woman's master plan here? This, this wisdom of Athena. Well, 
Hera sees right through it. She knows Wonder Woman's just going to try to become a god to try to defeat her from within. She saw right through it. It's absolute craziness. It's it's complete hogwash. There's no gravity to this situation whatsoever. And it's so disappointing. And um, it's just another example of why, you know, there's only one thing worse than the danger that what Themyscira poses and what the gods goes. And, and that's Wonder Woman's own stupidity. She can't get out of her own way. Would it have killed Diana for just once showing an ounce of intelligence, of strategy, of tactics? And this is what she does? I, I, I just, she's so stupid. I mean, just let the Justice League handle it, Wonder Woman. Just let the Justice League handle it. Step aside. Let somebody else handle it. Let the big boys handle it. Because if you're not good, if, you know, you, you're just not good enough. I'm, I'm so frustrated reading this. And uh, uh, I'm going gonna, gonna to lead right into the backup. With Queen, with uh, Queen Nubia, Nubia is about as useless as Wonder Woman, uh, which shouldn't surprise anyone if you've been reading Trial of the Amazons. Uh, a couple of, you know, uh, this was horrible. Two men <gasps> washed up on Themyscira, which of of course you're not allowed to do that because remember that uh, uh, Am Amazonians are all about equality, except. If you dare have men on Themyscira, that's a no-no. Two men wash up on Themyscira, and right away, that's like a, that's like a, that's like a, that's like a capital offense. I'm, oh my God, we got, we got two people with penises on our island. Quick, send out the Amazons, round them up. We can't, we can't have that now, can we? And then, before these men can be rounded up, they end up being killed by another. Looks like a man. Who, who basically warns the Amazons that they're going to be stripped of their gift of immortality. The gods are going to strip them of their gift of immortality. Which is interesting because when something is gifted, it by definition is no longer the person who gifted it. I don't know, you can't, once you give something, you can't take it back. But unless you're a god, of course. And, uh, but, so, you know, things are really heating up. The Amazons now are going to be stripped of immortality. The gods, Wonder Woman's a god now. Oh, humanity is being attacked. The gods are out for revenge. And all I can think of is how absolutely, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually enjoying this. I'm, cause I, I'm, I'm enjoying this rant cause it's therapeutic for me. I actually feel healthier as I'm venting, as I'm saying this, but I'm, I'm frustrated with this. And it's one of the reasons why as, as much trepidation as I have with Tom King coming on Wonder Woman. And I, I love most of what Tom King writes. I do have some trepidation when I read stuff like this, I'm thinking, how much worse could it be if Tom King wrote this title? I don't know. But then Tom King's probably saying, hold my beer and we'll have to, you know, so I got to be careful what I wish for. So, but in any event, um, I don't know, my friend, I'll let you talk now. I'm, I'm, I'm all ranted out. So you didn't like it. <laughs> no, I know I didn't like it. I, I really didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I actually didn't mind the backup, but I thought the backup was more interesting than the main story. Um, but, but, you know, again, uh, much like we were talking about the main story, and and the backup is written by the you know the right, regular writers of Wonder Woman, uh, Becky Clune and Michael W. Conrad. Aletha Martinez handles the art, um, and I thought the art you know was really strong. Mark Morales, John Livesey on inks, Alex Gormis on colors, Becky Carey on letters. Um, yeah, I thought it was it, it was definitely more interesting, um, but the the just the setup like the way the amazons are like i get the wanting to have three tribes or whatever and that's sort of interesting but the execution of it hasn't been good and now it's like too many cooks in the kitchen and so yeah you mentioned nubia being kind of useless it's kind of like <laughs> well you know it, I, I, th there was a simplicity to wonder woman when it was hippolyta was the queen diana is her daughter uh you know unbeknownst to everybody takes part in the contest wins the title of one woman go, gets to go to you know the outside world whatever there's a simplicity there um bringing in all these other tribes i get it you know diversity and, and all that kind of thing and you want to include people um but it's sort of muddied everything up um and so yeah i think ultimately the execution for that hasn't been great but yeah i uh, will see how it plays out but I, I didn't dislike this as much as you, but I, I think a lot of what you're saying is 100% valid. So, uh, all right. I'm sure you like this a lot better. Justice Society issue number three. This is from writer Jeff Johns. Mikhail Yanin and Jerry Ordway are the artists. Jordi Belair and John Kalis handle the colors. Rob Lee on letters. Uh, starts off with uh, the unknown soldier giving Easy Company, Sergeant Rock and Easy Company, some orders. Uh, confirmed per Degaton, as we suspected, is the villain. Um, and yeah, this is just so interesting. 
Um, and, you know, I'm a big fan of All-Star Squadron back in the day, Jerry Ordway, Roy Thomas. Um, Perdegaton has never felt as maniacal, as, uh, as Machiavellian, as formidable, as dangerous as he does here. And once again, shows how Jeff Johns has such a mastery of the the DCU, especially when it comes to the Justice Society. I mean, his Justice Society run in the in the two uh, thousands was beloved and still is beloved, and, and rightly so. Um, mixing that with this idea of rebirth and multiversity and all that, it, it, he's really firing on all cylinders. And you know, it makes me wish that he focused more on comics. But you know, and I, I know his. Uh, he loves DC Comics. He loves comic books in general. But yeah, he's you know he went to school to be a filmmaker, so I can understand why he's got his you know attention diverted by that. But um, it's disappointing that uh, we we got some news that the next couple of issues of this are going to be delayed because it already fit. Like if I have any nitpick about it, it does seem to to move a little slowly um, in terms of the the pacing. But uh, but overall, I'm still really enjoying this. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it makes me miss those days when Johns was writing, you know, a couple monthly books, and uh, you couldn't wait for the next issue. So, what what do you think of this? Uh, yeah, well, I, I will say that I was actually uh, first of all Jerry Ordway. I mean, I worship at the altar of Jerry Ordway. What fantastic art! It just, I think, I think this is some of his best art that he's ever done. I, I just love it, and I don't know what it is, and and maybe I'm wrong, and I'm going to I'll, You know what? I'll ask for forgiveness if I'm wrong. But is the delay? Are the delays due to Mikhail Janin's art? Uh, I'm 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 wondering uh, because he's he, he's always been one who's been slow in the past, and there's been delays contributed to his no. art. Uh, I I don't know. Or is it John's writing? He was never because Jerry you know, Ordway is fast. Jerry Ordway is a is a, is a very fast uh, artist. He's he's generally very competent. But it yeah, well, Yanin, you know, he was never late on Grayson, and he was never late on Justice League Dark. You know, but when you're young and hungry and trying to make a name for yourself, and then as you get bigger, you know, you're, yeah. you have a family, you have other responsibilities. I, I don't know. I yeah. mean, typically when John's books are late. You never really know. You, you hear, well, you know, you already have a slow artist and then you have somebody who, you know, if the artist is slow already and then he's waiting on the script. Well, or the other the other part is that, you know, with John's, um, there can be a lot of back and forth if editorial wants to make changes. And he's like, I'm Jeff Johns. I don't want to change change it, you know. And and I think that can. So I think it's a variety of factors. Well, it it, it could be. I, I will say this though that uh, as a criticism of this issue, I mean, look, the art's fantastic. Mikhail Janine, Jerry Ardway, the, the the time periods, the, the past where we have even call out callbacks to All Star Comics issue thirty five, JSA issue seventy two, Sergeant Rock showing up, the unknown soldier defeating Pert Degaton back in at the end of World War Two. I mean, just fantastic. Fantastic. And having Jerry Ordway doing that art, I'm getting chills just thinking about all my back issues of All-Star Squadron. I mean, I, you know, I just love it. And the, the revelation that Per Degaton isn't, isn't concerned about having the Nazis win World War II anymore. His machinations and his goals for uh, power are far greater than that. And obviously we know he's wiped out and he's killed Dr. Fate. He's wiped out the JSA in different time periods. And the only one that's managed to escape is the Huntress, the son, uh, pardon me, the daughter of... Catwoman and future Batman, and she's got this. They got she's got this talisman, this this globe that uh, that we that has made made its appearances in Flashpoint Beyond and a number of other series, and she's this Huntress is speaking to the modern day uh, Justice Society, talking about Per Degaton, and really all that happens is that she's she's just warning them, and she fights alongside them, and she's and there's there's scenes of her fighting Bizarros, and and uh, until ultimately the the end where Per Degaton shows up because he's looking for the talisman, he's looking for that globe, and he. Just out of the blue, Per Dagaton shows up looking for the globe. So uh, that's kind of a surprise instead of because all of us expecting that the JSA is going to look for Per Dagaton, you don't have to worry about it. He's coming to you whether you like it or not. And that's how this issue ends. A couple of other interesting things here that are just sort of shoehorned in, which I think is a sign of a DC editorial, uh, uh, you know, 
what was shoehorned in here is that Wildcat and Dr. Midnight, who were dead, who were previously killed, they, they, they were dead characters, they were brought back by the Lazarus resin. That was just literally mentioned as an afterthought on one of the pages. It's just randomly stated. All of a sudden, Yolanda, Mar Yolanda Montez shows up, and it says Yolanda Montez and Dr. Chapel Rose, and Dr. Chapel Rose is the second generation Dr. Midnight. Uh, they, 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 the, uh, from their, they rose from their graves in the jungles of Peridor, South America, during a precursor quake to what would be the Lazarus eruption, uh, which, so out of the blue, they just, they just appeared. So Johns utilizes the Lazarus planet to once again, just bring back characters, well, you know, as I guess as organically as possible, or just because, and it's the most convenient way to just shoehorn characters in that, I mean, rather than have a, why have a large complex storyline if you want dead characters back? You know, why do that? Just bring them back because of an exploding volcano. That Lazarus planet is the gift that keeps on giving and giving and giving. <laughs> you know what? I mean, you can bet down the road that thing is we're going to keep getting dead characters pop up and say, oh, no, 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 I'm not dead. Remember that volcano, volcanic eruption we had like five years ago? I, I came, I came back to life. Anyways, so there's that, and so I have. I'm having. I had fun with this issue, but not a lot happens. It's just literally hunters talking to the JSA, saying, "Look, Perdegaton's the threat. He's the bad guy." And then Perdegaton shows up at the end. In the meantime, we got beautiful art by Jerry Ordway in the past with World War II. We got some beautiful Easter eggs with the unknown soldier, Sergeant Rock, and, and, and Easy Company, and we got beautiful modern day art in the present by one uh, Joaquin Janine uh, with the present Justice Justice Society. But in terms of story, this is at a snail's pace, and that's where my criticism comes in here: is that you know maybe you're right editorially. There's some editorial issues there, and John's is having some arguments with editorial, which I mean, really edit. edit step aside I mean let the master do his work but I'm gonna I'm gonna be a little bit more hard on John's here I mean we did wait I haven't forgotten the two and a half years it took doomsday clock to come out I mean come on uh, and I, I'm not sure whose fault that was I, yes it was good when it when it finally came out it's a masterpiece as far as I'm concerned but still uh, this is this is a story at a snail's pace. We learned v almost nothing this issue other than it brought Protegaton to the present. And so I'm really hoping that whatever whatever DC's planning, I, I hope that they, they get their editorial shenanigans under control. And, you know, maybe, maybe it's a case of too many chiefs, not enough Indians at DC right now. But for the dawn of a DCU, uh, uh, I'm still looking for some better signs of uh, organization. And, uh, well... Fingers crossed moving forward, we'll have to wait and see how it goes. But uh, I did enjoy this issue, but it, it story-wise, it didn't it didn't move the story. It was a snail's pace of a story. Yeah, I mean, that's a criticism I have as, as well. And and yeah, you expect a certain level of storytelling from John's. He usually delivers. But when you have a story that's moving at a slower pace, and then on top of that, you have delays. Like, oh, my God, you know, you want to talk about Doomsday Clock. That's Gary Frank. We know he's not the fastest. Again... Uh was faster when he was younger, uh, certainly didn't seem to miss deadlines when he was on Birds of Prey, but then, you know, he wasn't, he was Gary Frank, not Gary Frank. So you can kind of <laughs> understand, you know, my, my point still stands that as these guys get, you know, make a bigger name for themselves that they, they you know, it's just the nature of the beast. You know, when, when you're trying to break in, you don't say no, yes, yes, yes. You make every deadline, you kill yourself. It's not healthy. It doesn't set a good precedent. Um, they make a name for themselves and, and I want them to make more money and I want them to, um, you know, get higher page rates and have a bigger name. But then, you know, the trade-off is now, you know, it's Gary Frank. He's going to turn it in when he turns it in. Um, but to go back to, you know, John's, you, you mentioned Doomsday Clock. You didn't mention Batman Three Jokers. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that took even longer than Doomsday Clock. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Jason Faba. And again, somebody who very quickly came on the scene and made a name for himself and now can pick and choose his projects. But yeah, he's not, and you can understand when you look at the art, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. You can understand why it takes so long, but for fans, it's frustrating. Um, and at least, you know, we, we waited a long time for doomsday clock, like you said, but at least it was worth it. I would argue that, uh, uh that wait for Batman three jokers was not worth it for me. Yeah. So anyway, uh, last book, Multiversity Harley screws up the DCU from uh, writer Frank Thierry. Logan Barber handles the pictures. Farron Delgado on letters. Ben Mears. Uh, well, I guess um, I guess Logan Farber did the colors as well. 
Um, so anyway, I tried to read this, um, all respect to Frank Thierry. This is the old super zany, crazy Harley Quinn. Um, and it's just, I'm not a fan. <laughs> I'm just not a fan. So I, I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't read it. I, I didn't enjoy it. Um, and yeah, uh, again, I, I, I got through, I think, four pages, five pages the first time and only two the second time. And I just, yeah, it just wasn't for me. So uh, I can't really say much more than that. Uh, I didn't read it. So what do you think? Uh, well, I mean, it, um, like I said, I'm not, <clears throat> I have, uh, I just have, I, at this point, I'm just crazied out when it comes to Harley. And that's not Frank Thierry's fault, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm like you, I just have a bias that I'm just not into these stories anymore. I just, uh, so I don't think anybody could come along and, and write a, a crazy zany Harley story that I, that I would probably care to read. Cause I just, I want, I have a, I have a particular bias and I, I'm an, I'm probably an outlier here and I'll just say it. I, I frankly would like a more evil Harley and I mean evil or more on the evil side of the anti-hero. Same for Poison Ivy. Uh, they're turning him into lipstick lesbians, and uh, and they're just, I'm just not a, I'm not a, I would rather have more evil, crazy, psychotic, more on the evil side. Uh, I've always been of the mindset that uh, Harley was not abused by the Joker. The Joker was equally abused by Harley. That's why they got along so badly and so well. Uh, that's, that's my take, but I digress. This, this issue ends uh, of Harley screwing up the DC Universe with Harley meeting herself. We already had, I mean, I, I know that it's not Frank Thierry's fault, but he, he probably, when he wrote this, he wasn't paying attention to what Stephanie Phillips was doing in the pages of Harley, but we already had a bunch of Harleys in that storyline and the Harley who laughs, and now we're getting a Harley showing up in this universe uh, while it's really not Harley that screws up the DC universe. Well, I guess it is. It's another Harley that screws up the DC universe. And look, it's funny. It's supposed to be a joke, so it's, on the one hand, it's, you know, it's really unfair of me to criticize a story that's meant to be absolutely insane and crazy, and so um, it, it, it's all right, but I mean, honestly, I, I, I never, I don't find, I didn't find it all that funny. And uh, I, I'm not, I'm not a particular fan. You know, the art is very wacky. It's, you know, it's, you know, uh, again, it's, it's this whole style of Harley where we're supposed to laugh at her jokes while she's going around smashing heads in and killing people with a baseball bat and there's blood everywhere. Um, but yet she's zany and she's lovely and we're supposed to, I guess she's, a, she's, I, I, to me, there's just with the zany, it's such a, an eclectic, psychedelic, crazy, inconsistent tone when, when, when ever, anything goes with Harley, she's crazy. She's perfect. She's a, she's, she's loving. She's, she's perfect. She's, she's zany. She's, she gets along and that, and she's got, it's just, it's when, when you're, when you try to be everything for everyone, you're you're just not interesting, at least not to me. And so that's how this comes across this issue. I just, I really don't care. And I, I really think, you know, I personally, um, I think one of the most incompetent characters in the DC universe, if you want to be blunt about it, is Harley. So Harley screwing up the DC universe, well, it better be a comedy because it's definitely a joke. So anyways, I'll just, that's all I got to say about that. Yeah. Um, again, I, I mean, I kind of echo your sentiments in terms of, yeah, zany, crazy Harley, uh, read enough of that. It's just not for me. Um, although I don't agree with you in terms of, I would like to see more evil Harley. For <laughs> me, we've had so many good stories of Harley where she's so competent, you know, like I think of uh, Joker Harley criminal sanity, where she's very much a straight laced criminal profiler, um, with some skeletons in her closet. To me, that that's so interesting and complex and, uh, I'm enjoying that much more. Or you, you want to get a little more traditional Harley, um, the version of Harley in Sean Gordon Murphy's uh, Murphyverse. Yeah, um, th that's a really interesting Harley with you know really complicated, married to Bruce Wayne. You know it, that is interesting to me. But those are more grounded Harleys. The zany stuff, yeah, it just just not for me. So uh, anyway. Uh, a couple of collections that are out this week. Batman Volume 5, Fear State. This wraps up um, the Batman Joker War. Um, and 
uh, I think this is the next to last trade that uh, from James Tynan's run on Batman. There's also an Adam Strange Deluxe Edition hardcover, Adam Strange Between Two Worlds. It collects Adam Strange 1 through 3 from 1990, crossed over with JLA 20 and 21, and then Adam Strange 1 through 8 from 2004. Um, so you have some really great writers on this. You have Mark Wade, Andy Diggle, Richard Brunning, Pasquale Ferry, um, and some great artists as well, Howard Porter, Arnie Jorgensen. So um, I, I've never read a lot of that stuff. Um, like Mark, to me, the idea of Mark Wade on Adam Strange, really, really good. Uh, I'm a big fan of Andy Diggle. I know a lot of people haven't heard of uh, Richard Brunning, but uh, supposedly his run on Adam Strange is really good as well. So I think I'm going to have to track that down. Uh, speaking of Jeff Johns and JSA, we've got JSA by Jeff Johns book five trade paperback collects JSA 46 or 58 and Hawkman 23 through 25. There was a, apparently a crossover. Um, there's a new YA graphic novel called Bruce Wayne, not super from a writer named Stuart Gibbs. And the artist is Barrett Peckmezzi. Um, don't know anything about what that's about other than it's in that YA line. And then finally, uh, Deathstroke Incorporated Volume 2 collects that year one story that um, Rocky and I both loved. Uh, Ed Brisson is the writer. Dexter Soy handles the interior art. Um, Mikhail Yanin handled the covers. And I remember when that started off, we were both kind of like, well, we know Deathstroke's origin. We know what Slade went through. So this is going to feel like a retread, but all credit to Ed Brisson and Dexter Soy for some powerful art that it, it, it kind of fleshed out his origin for me so much more and made us understand who Slade is so much more, um, made him in a lot of ways more sympathetic and interesting. Um, not that he already, you know, didn't live in that gray area, but there are times where he slipped into kind of the mustache twirling villain, um, certainly played that role in, uh, the Judas contract. Um, as beloved as that is. Um, so anyway, those are the collections that are out this week. Um, strong week for DC. Uh, I don't know what you're going to pick for your book. Of, oh, I do know. It's got to be Revenge of the Gods, right? Book of the Week. I <laughs> know. Uh, uh, well, before I do my pick of the week, I do want to uh, I want to give a shout out. I do want to mention that uh, uh, Cy Spurrier uh, coming out with the news that he's going to be writing The Flash, uh, maybe with a more cosmic horror element. Uh, we, we're all going to miss Jeremy Adams uh, come September. Uh, but Cy Spurrier, uh, I find it interesting. Uh, you and I did enjoy Suicide Squad Blaze, which was Black Label, written by Bla uh, Cy Spurrier. It was definitely kind of a, it, there was some cosmic elements and a lot of horror elements there. It's hard to imagine that the, the cosmic horror for Wally West, how that's going to play out. But Cy Spurrier has made some comments that he, that he is very, he's very mindful he is very much aware of the love that people have for Jeremy Adams' uh, inter iteration of, of Wally West. And so it's going to be interesting to see how Cy Spurrier, uh, Cy Spurrier how he incorporates, uh, you know, into his own interpretation. I I'm hoping some of the family elements of Wally West. So do uh, you have any comments on that? Yeah, Cy Spurrier and The Flash. Um, that goes together in my mind like peanut butter and pickles. <laughs> it's, 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 I've absolutely disgusting uh but there are a select few people that that really love it um this sounds like a, a horrible matchup obviously i always say you know give the series a chance give a writer a chance a couple three issues to see but yeah his writing and there's things that he's done that i've absolutely loved but it tends to be more kind of out there more psychedelic more esoteric and that's just not not only is it not flash it's specifically not the tone of flash that we've had from Jeremy Adams, which has been great. Everybody's been loving it. And it's yeah. almost like they thought, okay, flash is selling really well. It's climbing the charts. How can we ruin it? Let's pick somebody who's the exact polar opposite of Jeremy Adams sensibility and put him on flash. Like DC, are you trying to alienate readers? It's just such a strange choice to me. I mean, I hope it'll be great. And there's every possibility that it will be. Cy Spurrier is a very talented writer. Yeah. I actually prefer him on independent stuff where the sky's the limit and he can do anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, he so, did write, yeah, he did write a good Hellblazer there for a while, but then they, they DC cut him off Hellblazer. Uh, they, they cut his Hellblazer series short on him. No. And then, 
again, that's magic, and it's Hellblazer. Yeah. Sky's the yeah. limit. <laughs> yeah. Go nut. You know, he can go nuts. He can do anything. And, and you um, and I were pretty hard on Cy Spirier. His backup and detectives were. I wasn't a big fan of those. I thought they were very hard to understand. Uh, but yeah. then again, there the art never helped him in that regard. So. Uh, and he's got a deep, but he is paired with a decent artist here on Flash. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, yeah, who's the artist? I, I don't um, uh, you know what? I'm drawing a blank. I thought it was on the. Uh, I don't. Well, well you, for those listening, you'll have to Google it. But uh, the. Uh, uh, I'm yeah. I, I'm not. Mike Diodato. Ah, yeah, Mike Diodato. I like Mike Diodato's art. I, I mean, love he's, Mike Diodato. Yeah, coming back to DC, he's been doing so, stuff. Um, I love, I love his independent work. Though. He's yeah, he's been doing yeah, for been A W A. So yeah, 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 good. So uh, what about? I wanted to make some comments on Steelworks. Uh, Michael Dorn, who plays Worf on Star Trek, is the writer of Steelworks, and I got to tell you, I'm generally not a big fan of getting people who are just through screenplays or actors getting them to come write comics has generally never worked out well at all but i gotta tell you i've really been enjoying start uh picard season three i hated seasons one and two but season three i really like and Worf was on there so uh not that that has anything to do with this is still works but i'm trying to find some reason to have some well, hope here so uh, bruce campbell did a good job recently on this uh, sergeant rock yeah um, uh, although i will say that was you know i i do think that was very by the numbers and yeah. you know not, not particularly uh high, you know high high you know <laughs> high resolution plot by any stretch of the imagination yeah. but in any event i so I, I don't really have much of an opinion on steelworks here so i'm i i'm open to be pleasantly surprised well i will say this michael dorn is a very passionate creator and mo people know him as an actor but he has had a lot of input doing other things um producing and working behind the scenes and uh yeah, so I, I, I think this is an inspired choice, actually. Um, and, you know, you can't help but, you know, immediately say, well, Michael Dorn's got to play John Henry Irons in the, uh, in the movie. You know, <laughs> got to be better than what Shaq did, right? And I think yep. it would be a, actually a good choice, especially where John Henry Irons is, you know, at, at this point in the DCU where he's kind of, you know, older hero really his niece Natasha has really taken over the, the front line sort of thing. And he's kind of taken a step back. So my, yeah, my, I, you could a hundred percent see it, right? Like if there's anything Hollywood loves, it's uh, Hey, let's, let's make this, let's focus on a female hero or, you know, especially one of color, you know, diversity and inclusion and rightly so the pendulum needs to swing back the other way, what have you, but uh, you could definitely well, see them getting some, um, you know, hot name, young, uh, African American actress to play it, and then Michael Dorn brings in the older crowd. You could 100% see that. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if that's what Warner Brothers is kind of laying the groundwork for here. Um, yeah. Who knows? I don't know how big of a Steel fan James Gunn is. So yeah. he's running the show over there right now. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, the one that I'm I'm hoping to be pleasantly surprised by is Hawk Girl. Uh, my I'm going to shout out Tim of Hawk World on Twitter. Uh, he's been crying for a Hawk title for forever since we lost Hawkman uh, Venditti's fantastic Hawkman 24 issues there that we, we all enjoyed so much but it was the little engine that could and it was well done by Venditti uh, I'm not that you know this uh, Axelrod writer uh, I'm, and the, the writer and artist are not particularly well known I know Adriana Lucas she's an amazing colorist but I'm, I'm less familiar with the, with the writer Axelrod and the and the, the Nihil Pan artist although it does sign a kind of sound familiar, but I yeah, we typically we typically have liked Ammon K's art, Nahula Pan. Uh, Adriana Lucas is a is a man and his colors oh. are fantastic. <laughs> I and then Jen, yeah, Jenza Axelrod, uh, I believe is a trans uh, person. Okay. Um, and has only done things in DC anthologies as far as I know. Um, nothing I can recall that really stands out where they knocked it out of the park. Yeah. So yeah. Um, well, this is the first time that this is the first time that Hawkgirl got her own title, starting with issue one. She took over the Hawkman title in the middle of Hawkman's run from uh, the, that Jeff John started, and I think I think Howard Chaikin wrote Hawkgirl for a while uh, back in the day. 
Um, but yeah, which, which, if you want this to succeed, DC, why would you not put a name writer on there? Yeah, nothing I, against uh, yeah. Axelrod, but people aren't going to go, oh, Axelrod. Yeah, let me let me jump on that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I I, I agree with you, especially with Hawkgirl. But I, I I think it's fair to say that they're you know I mean they're they, they want to this is obviously a, a they want to open up the doors and uh, to diversity for their writers and, and and all the power to them because you know every now and then I, I don't think I don't think anyone in the Big Two has had a tremendous amount of success, uh, frankly taking that approach, but. That doesn't mean that we can't uh, get uh, we we can't be pleasantly surprised because hey Jeremy Adams surprised all of us yeah, and yeah, he was out of exactly. the blue and so who says Axelrod can't surprise us all the power to they or whatever pronoun Axelrod uses they her him whatever uh, I, I love Hawker I love and it's Kendra Saunders Kendra Saunders is my favorite iteration I know some people were hoping it was Shara Hall. I'm more of a Kendra Saunders fan, of, uh, and so I'm really, I'm really glad that it's her and uh, not, uh, and not Shara Hall. So, yeah, I, I was going to make that exact same point about Jeremy Adams. Uh, we know that when Dan Didio was playing in five G, he was looking to bring in, you know, all kinds of writers from, like DC Animation had been doing Gangbusters with their animated movies, so he, he, you know, actively approached the animation division and said, hey. He's, give me some names of people who do do a good job these are people that didn't have that much experience writing comics and yeah did everybody succeed no but we got some great stuff like jeremy adams flash so yeah there's every possibility um like everybody's got to start somewhere right yeah so all right so i'll give my pick of the week uh my pick of the week is uh is the is Danger Street uh that's definitely my pick of the week uh, uh t- <laughs> nothing yeah, yeah. Uh, I like some of the other comics, but this was nothing came close to this. I really, really enjoyed this, uh, particularly the revelations about Lady Cop. I thought it was very well done. What about yourself? Yeah, I'm I'm in the same boat. You know, normally if you pick something, I'll try to pick something different. But this was to me <laughs> head and shoulders above the other stuff. You know, don't get me wrong. I really enjoyed uh, Superman Lost uh, much more than I expected to. I heard Chris, Christopher Priest and Superman. Eh, I don't know how well that's going to work. Um, Batman Incorporated had its best issue so far. Um, Batgirls was a big improvement. Just Society continues to be intriguing, if if not slow. But yeah, for me, Danger Street also pick of the week. I I, I can't I can't in good conscience pick anything else. So, uh, all right. So agree, disagree. Let us know. Leave a comment in the uh, comment section below if you're watching us on YouTube, or you know, head on over to Twitter. Comic Source or Comic Boom on Twitter and let us know what your thoughts are. Uh, if you are checking us out on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to Rocky's channel. You know what to do when you get to YouTube. Like, subscribe, ring the notification bell, all that great stuff. Uh, if you have stumbled across us on YouTube and you're curious about the other audio-only content from the Comic Source, just go to wherever you get your podcast, do a search for the Comic Source and subscribe. We appreciate all the support, all the love you guys give us, all the comments and interactions and what have you. Uh, we wouldn't do it if you guys weren't out there listening. So that's going to do it for this episode. Appreciate it, everybody. Again, apologies uh, that I'm on the road and it was a little late, but it was enjoyable. Good week. All right. We'll talk to you next time. All right. Catch you guys later.